So now we go to the uh, item of Bible reading, the reading of the Bible, uh, and we are going to discuss some of the principles of the early church. The Bible presents to us the spirit and life of God. It introduces him to us and testifies to him through his revelation to the prophets, apostles, and men of, or, and women of God. It also entreats and invites us to test what these biblical men of God have tested and to know him as they have known him in order to enter into a personal fellowship with him. The scriptures show us the way we should walk in order to behold God and be united with him. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 17, they light the path and provide us with a spirit of faith which strengthens our will to continue the walk towards the Lord. They testify to the Lord as the only one who grants eternal life. The words of the scriptures accompany us from the beginning of the journey to its end, holding our hands, keeping us, and taking us gradually upwards to the top of the mountain, the mountain of worship, in the different levels of our fellowship with the Holy Trinity. They take us gently from one level to the other and from one depth to the other, pro prog progressively, progressively, revealing their mysteries to us as much as we can bear and take. We are not meant to stop at the level of intellectual knowledge of the Word of God, interpreting the words, understanding the backgrounds, analyzing the biblical characters, and mentally meditating on God's comforting words. It is good. But the scriptures entreat us and invite us to enter into our spiritual inheritance which the Lord has prepared for us beforehand. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the inheritance through the Bible in order to live it and live for it and buy it. Therefore, as the children, we need to hold unto the Holy Spirit the utterer of the Word of God, who is like a mother who feeds us the pure milk. When our inner man grows, the Holy Spirit reveals to us the hidden mysteries behind the words of the scripture, which are solid food for the mature, as the book Hebrews chapter 5, 14 puts it, so that we may become strong and we no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, as Paul puts it in Ephesians 4, 14. As much as our souls are purified and sanctified, our special eyes become enlightened and our minds are opened by the grace to comprehend the secrets and mysteries of the Word of God and live by them. It is written in the book of Psalms 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Actually, this is just a very short introduction, but now I like to go to how to read the Word of God according to some of the principles of the life of the early worshippers of the church in the early centuries. Approaches to reading the Bible are numerous, are numerous and hugely variant in our current generation. Yet, there seems to be two main approaches that are most prevalent in most of the spiritual circles, and these are Number one, an approach that advocates the necessity of reading the Bible slowly and carefully while meditating on every word or passage. The focus is on the quality rather than the quantity. This approach favors reading only a short passage or one chapter daily, where the reader meditates carefully on all the words to understand them and come out with the lessons learned from the passage. Number two, the second approach, which is more common and widely spread both in the East and West, it is the scholastic analytical approach, which studies and interprets the Word of God. This approach focuses on the importance of reading and understanding the Word of God 
through studying the historical and geographical backgrounds, the language origins, the meaning of names, significance of numbers, symbols, and what they refer to, and so on. It favors summing up a chapter or a book of scripture into main points, studying the reasons, causes, lessons, and making tables of comparison. And all these approaches are great and blessed. Yet, do we realize that the first approach has led the church and God's people to great poverty in their fellowship with the word of God? In addition, this poverty, in addition to this poverty, there is also the danger of the interference of personal preferences and convictions in understanding and interpreting the biblical passages. The safeguard in this matter is to read and understand the scriptures with a kindled spirit in an atmosphere of prayer so that all the understanding and meditation would well out from the spring of the spirit and not from the activity of one's soul and personal preferences. In following this approach, there is also a tendency to ignore the biblical passages that are difficult to understand. In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 1 to 12, for example, we read how the people of Israel gathered in an atmosphere of prayer, worship, and bowing down, bowing down in the presence of God, while Ezra, the scribe, and the Levites read from the book of the law of Moses from morning until midday, that is, for several successive hours. This kind of reading resulted in great conviction, and the people wept. Then this was quickly transformed into amazing and holy spiritual joy. Weeping and then dancing. The danger of the second approach, based on intellectual analysis, is that it is purely intellectual one, relying on the mental activity and putting the word of God under the authority of the mind alone. This in turn limits the word of God so much. It limits its meanings and effectiveness, restrict, restricting it to a very narrow sphere. For example, if someone conducts a thorough study of a certain book of scripture, he would then think that he has covered this book of scripture completely and therefore he cannot receive anything new by reading it again. On a broader level, and in addition to the above mentioned limitation, we would also wonder how can the word of God be effective and live for every generation, everywhere, and at all times, and to all the different sectors of people alike, with the variations of their intellectual abilities and gifts. They are different in their abilities, so their understanding will be different. If we can restrict its meaning and ideas in points and specific interpretation, which limit its broadness and hence its effectiveness for the people, it is written, in the book of Psalms 119, 96, I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandments is exceedingly broad. The word of God has no limits because it is the utterness of the infinite God and it bears his unlimited mind. Therefore, it is suitable and valid for all times and every place and for all people alike. It can be understood at various levels, which suit the beginner and the spiritually mature, the uneducated and the highly educated, with excelling intellectual abilities. As we mature spiritually, we understand the Word of God and view it in a new way. We understand its mysteries and meanings as if we were reading it for the first time. We would continue 
to progressively grow in this knowledge until the coming age. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. This leads us to an important question in this context. How did the early fathers of the church view the Bible and how did they deal with it? The fathers of the early centuries were distinguished by their deep knowledge of the word of God and being filled with it, as the scripture says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Therefore, they became the experts of their generation and the reference for the nobles of their age who sought their guidance in all matters. They were the pillars of the ecumenical synods, where the council would not meet without their presence, nor decisions were taken without their counsel. How did these great fathers of the church deal with the word of God and what was their relationship with it and their conviction about it? The early father of the church realized that the mystical work of the word of God is important. This is based on its work inside man and not dependent on the activity of one's mind and soul. For them, this mystical work is so broad in its dimensions and meaning. Now we are going to shed some light on the mystical work of the Word of God through some highlights from the life of the early fathers. The first point, the word of God is the breath of God. This is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The English word put it inspired. The Greek word for inspired is breath of God. The early fathers realized that the Holy Scriptures are the breath of God, which comes from God himself. Therefore, they read it in faith and awareness that by so doing they allow the breath of God to enter into them and hence they receive the life, the life of God in them. And, and indeed the word of God revived them, strengthened their bones, kindled their spirits, quenched their, the thirst of their souls filled them with eternal life and even transformed them into the image of God because it is the breath of God which bears his life. They used to read the books of scriptures, especially the gospels, while standing in a state of worship. This worship approach in reading the Bible is accompanied with many prostrations they did so to prepare themselves for receiving the grace and the gift of the word of God and absorbing the life of God in it. Because this is their conviction, they dealt with the Bible differently, standing, prostrating, they are, they are receiving something, really, and every time they come to read the Bible. Another point, second point, the Word of God has a purifying and sanctifying effect for their inner soul and places. According to the conviction of the early fathers, the Word of God has a sanctifying and purifying work inside the man. A good illustration is the well-known story about one of the monks who went to his spiritual father complaining that he does not understand the words he reads in the Bible, and hence Reading is in vain and not necessary. So his father asked him to bring a bucket that has holes, fill it with water and take it to a far place. He asked him to do this several times. Then he finally asked him, did any water stay in the bucket? The monk replied, no, the water leaked from the bucket. 
then the father told him to look carefully at the pocket and what has happened to it. He drew his attention that it has been completely cleaned from all the dust and dirt that were hanging to it. The father then continuing saying, similarly my son, the fallen soul cannot keep the word of life or perceive the mysteries of the word of God, of God initially. Yet, at the beginning, the work of the word of God in the soul is to purify it, cleanse it, until there are no more holes or gaps. If one continues in this regularly, it leads to enlightenment, after which the spiritual mind starts to perceive and understand the hidden meanings and treasures behind the words of the scriptures and the great mysteries of the word of God. Besides realizing the inner purifying effect of the word of God, the early fathers also realized that reading the word of God out loud leads to the sanctification and cleansing of the place where the worshiping reader is and not only the inner sanctification. Therefore, they learned how to sanctify their places through worship and reading the word of God a lot in these places. The third principle. The word of God is the manna which nourishes the spirit. We have already referred to that in the item of prayer. The early fathers viewed the word of scripture as the hidden manna, that is, mystical food that nourishes and revives their spirits and helps their spirits to, go, to grow. Therefore, they were characterized by the feature of chewing on the word of God. As the flesh needs to eat regularly in order to grow in a healthy way, the inner man needs the food to grow. The food of the inner man is the Holy Scriptures. According to the early fathers, chewing on the word of God means reading it regularly and intensely and reading, reading it again and again, whether they understand whether they understand what they read or even if they are unable to understand. This seems to be very ridiculous to our new way of thinking, new generation. They did so without referring to Bible commentator, commentaries, uh, Bible interpretation books or, or whatever. This is because they believed that the word of God explains itself by itself. So if one wants to know the meaning or the significance of a word in the scriptures, he can do so by finding all the meanings and occurrences of this word in different biblical passages because God's mind is one and the same in both testaments. Of course, this does not mean at all that we must ignore the interpretation books. It is helpful, but this is another approach. Because they read the books of scriptures repeatedly and they chew on them, the whole Bible opened up and was revealed before them like one coherent, complex, complete text. Therefore, in their replies to questions asked by those who seek their counsel or even their replies refuting heresies, the early fathers took the person so a linked chain of biblical verses and passages in both testaments. As a result, all the doubts, all the darkness of the mind, and the fleshly wisdom disappeared. The early fathers memorized several books of scriptures by heart. In their biographies, we often read that such and such a father has memorized all the New Testament, some of the books of Old Testament by heart, or that father has memorized the epistles, the gospels, prophetic books, and the book of Psalms, not more. A great part. The Bible was the food on which they nourished and chewed on, on for long successive hours without boredom or inconsistency. Another principle, number four. 
the word of God and acquiring the prophetic spirit. The relation between reading the word of God and acquiring the prophetic spirit. The early fathers realized that the, the importance of acquiring the prophetic spirit through reading and chewing on the holy scriptures, especially the prophetic books. According to the New Testament, the prophetic spirit does not refer to telling future matters. It is written in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men, nothing about telling the future. This is not at all the office of the New Testament. It is not related to the Old Testament. There is something related to telling the future in the New Testament when it is uh, a lot of gifts coming together, forming an office with a special anointing. But it is not now, it is our scope of speaking. Therefore, the prophetic spirit refers to whatever helps man understand God's will and the correct picture that God desires for our spiritual life. In addition to this, the prophetic spirit helps man acquire a spiritual insight and discernment. We are in great need for this kind of fine discernment in generation where the schools of thoughts and the disparity and spiritual approaches have increased. This requires divine light that separates and judges confusing matters. As it is written in 1 Corinthians 2.15, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. So there is a real importance for the prophetic spirit. In the biography of Saint Shenouda, the Archmind Wright, uh, who lived in a uh, century, in the year of three, 348 to 466, the 4th and 5th century, we read wondrous mysteries about the fellowship of the early fathers with the word of God and specifically with the prophetic spirit. One of the stories related to, to him say that while one of the brothers was reading the books of the prophets, Saint Shenouda saw that the prophet of each book of the scriptures came and stood next to the brother until he completed reading his prophecy. And then the prophet would sit next to, to, to the brother after finishing reading. This continued until the brother reached the book of Malachi. Then the brother, reading the book of Malachi, fell asleep because he was awake all the night reading. But then the prophet Malachi, who came down and was standing beside the brother, did not leave him. He stood next to him, waiting and waiting. So the prophet Ezekiel told Saint Shenouda, please, wake up the brother so that he would finish reading the book of Malachi, and then the prophet Malachi will come and sit with us. Saint Shenouda woke him up, and the brother completed reading the book of Malachi, then the prophet left him and joined the rest of the prophets who went, to on, who went on talking to Saint Shenouda about the great wonders of God. And then they left. How amazing these things are. We may doubt about this because of our intellect cannot accept everything. Yet, they reveal to us depths in the life of the early fathers and how they invited the spirit of the prophet, the writer of the book of scriptures, to accompany them while reading so that they may receive the prophetic spirit that inspired the prophet in writing his prophecy. They can receive the same anointing, part, at least part of the same anointing that was on the prophet writing a special book. Therefore, when any of the fathers struggled to understand some biblical passages, they used to ask the writer of the book to help them understand the parts they struggled with. This often happened whether in a visible or non-visible way. Another principle, a spiritual hunger and transformation into Christ-likeness. One of the important things regarding the early father's relationship with the word of God is that 
their great eagerness and love for the word of God welled out of their deep spiritual hunger. Their unceasing desire to know God, his will, his ways, the desire to be transformed into his image and their longing for the formation of Christ within them, all these factors help them to go deep in the word of God. Therefore, they refused to reply anyone who came to them asking about biblical matters for the purpose of mental disputes or gaining a spiritual knowledge without having a desire to change inwardly. For them, such a person works in the trade of the people of the world. In other words, he wants to gain this biblical knowledge to boast and to show off or even to transfer it to others as mere teaching and knowledge, trading with it as the people of the world do without first being transformed by it. As a result, the early fathers did not adopt the approach of studying the word of God to gain mental knowledge, as is the case nowadays, unfortunately. They were hungry for God and for knowing him and his ways through the Holy Scriptures. In this respect, St. Augustine used to say, as I read the scriptures, I see the baby Jesus wrapped in the pages of the book. This is how the early fathers lived and this is the extent of love they had for the word of God. Now I'd like to share with you the practical side, how the worshippers of the early church dealt or used the Bible in their daily spiritual life. I can state 12 different ways. Let us begin with the first one. It is the usual or common way. It is like we do now. Let us begin with this, just to read and read and examine the passage or chapter, trying to hear God speaking to oneself through his daily circumstances. So it is important to link our Bible reading with our own circumstances, so that the word of God is open more and more, and you can find divine instruction related to our circumstances. This is number one. Number two, meditations or contemplation. Of course, there is difference between the two uh, words. In the book of Psalms 119, uh, verse 15, it reads, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. This is according to the English Standard Version. The word used here in Hebrew, the word translated into meditate, in Hebrew it is siak, and in English means to ponder, to convene, to commu commune, and it is uh, used 20 times in the whole Bible, 14 in the book of Psalms. It is a word of prayer. And Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, it reads, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. The word meditate here is a different word in the Hebrew language. It is haga, and it means in the lexicons murmur. Used 25 times in the whole Bible and 10 times in the book of Psalms. It is again words very related to the uh, life of worship. Usually they ruminate the word of God again and again, sometimes with short statements of prayer, with the aim of letting it sink down in inner man and releasing its manifold actions, cleansing, enlightenment, and transformation. Now the third way, reading much. They may read many chapters in one sitting or even more preferably reading a whole book in one sitting. What is the aim of this reading? The aim here is to get the full idea of the book. It's a theme. It's a message of God in the book. 
because the message of God is delivered in different situations and every time it is unique it helps us to understand God's mind and God's ways again another aim is realizing that the whole Bible is actually one continuous story it is the story of God's love mercy for mankind another point we notice that there is no titles or special names for the books of the Bible only the name of the writer like Isaiah Jeremiah Mark John this means that the titles are left for everyone to put it according to his own perception and this this leads to a full divine library with different books having different titles and themes and whenever one faces a challenge or being a special need he can turn to the corresponding book in his library read it again and again to discover the proper <coughs> direction he has to take in his situation also this rich times of reading the word helps a lot in renewing the mind and cleansing the soul bringing a real genuine inner healing and restoration it is written in the book of Psalms 107 verse 20 he sent his word and healed them. It has a power of healing. Also in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, 22, for they, referring to the words of wisdom, for they are life to those who find it and health to all their flesh. And because of this, we have the, the, the poor writing to the Colossians 3, 16, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Another way, the fourth way, worshiping reading. We have already mentioned this in the prayer. Just to remind you, every book in the Bible still carries the anointing that came on, he, on the writer, whether prophet or evangelist or historian or poet. And understanding this truth and working on it enable us to perceive from the same anointing because it is pres preserved it is kept in the particular book it's very interesting point accordingly reading the prophetic book as I have just said uh, regularly on a regular basis brings prophetic anointing the gospel brings apostolic anointing and so on interestingly enough they use to say some special statements or phrases to conclude the readings and these statements differ from book to book showing their deep understanding of God's economy in the scriptures and also reflecting their interaction during reading as an example if reading Old Testament they conclude with the statement glory be glory be to the Trinity why do they conclude with this phrase it is because the Holy Trinity was not revealed in Old Testament as if they are identifying themselves with the writers of Old Testament who were hoping for the full revelation of the person of God and it happened in New Testament if reading Gospels they conclude with saying glory be to God because God's glory was revealed to us through Christ if reading the epistles of Paul, they conclude saying, the grace of God, the Father, be with us. This is because Apostle Paul was the one who taught us about the grace of God. If reading other epistles of the New Testament, they conclude saying, don't love the world or things of the world. Because the content of these epistles is mainly directed towards proper Christian conduct in the world if reading the book of Acts they conclude saying the word of the Lord shall grow and multiply because the work of the Holy Spirit is still going on from generation to generation till the second coming of Christ 
And finally, if reading the book of Revelation, they conclude with, he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the churches. It is taken from the book of Revelation. Now the fifth way, reading the story of men of God. All these ways are applicable and through my seclusion years I applied different ways in different times and, and I can testify for the real fruit and the real impact that cannot even put into words that can come from every way of these ways. Reading the story of men of God. Like the life of Abraham, life of Moses, life of uh, Paul, and so on. The purpose here is to get inspired with the main blessing and anointing of this man of God. Examples. If I feel lack of faith, or I feel my faith is weak or is, is drained, I go to Abraham and read from Genesis 12:24 to get enriched in my face, revived in my face. If I feel myself irrelevant or not so concerned with the, the state of the church, the state of the people of God, I go to Moses, Exodus chapter 1 to 24, to receive from his anointing as a real man of concern for his people. If I have a weak life of worship. I go to David, the worshiper, and read from 1 Samuel 16 to 2 Samuel to the end of the book. This will show me David as a worshiper. Here I am focused on the life of a man of God with a special anointing. If I feel very cold, like an, a, a piece of ice, I go to Elijah, the prophet of fire, and read from 1 Kings 17 to 2 Kings chapter 2. In my years also of, of seclusion, I memorized all these things and I use them accordingly. When I feel I need to do that anointing or that anointing, I continue reading these chapters prayerfully, quietly, even some dialogue that helps me to receive the anointing and uh, kept in these uh, chapters. Now, next way, gazing into Jesus, disclosing the mystery of Christ to gaze into Jesus. They used to read the New Testament weekly, to read all of it every week. And they learned how to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus' footsteps in the story of the Gospel. For example, sometimes it takes part of the chapter, only short part. Sometimes it takes two chapters and a half. They try to find what was the day of Jesus in this story and then try to, to focus on the days of Jesus to learn how he lived his days. And how has he dealt with the different people in different situations. They read his story, pray it, absorb it, so that his lifestyle is printed and imparted in their lives. Now, next way, next way, reading the Bible as a spiritual food to feed the inner man. Simply, it means eating, eating the Word of God. Even, let it be by part the mind and get it down into their spiritual bellies, spiritual belly. It needs some sort of training, because here, the focus is not to meditate or to find some deep thing, but just to eat the Word of God as if I am I'm facing, a f I'm, I'm reading the Bible as a food and try to eat it. And here we have some references. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me joy and rejoicing of my heart. And you can find the same thing in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, and the book of Revelation, chapter 10, 9 and 10. Now, the eighth way, reading the Bible out loud, slowly and with low voice. What is the idea and purpose here? Two main ideas. Activating the spiritual senses. They used to say, 
the Bible must be read with all the senses. We use our eyes, our ears, our taste. When we read that way, we read, we hear, we read using our eyes, we hear the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. Even we taste in the Spirit the different savors of the Word of God. It is true, it needs experience, it needs training, and then it will change everything. In addition to that, proclaimed, the, the proclaimed Word of God sanctifies their being, the being of a person, their places, increasing their spiritual authority. It is well known that the spoken word has its own authority. God distinguished man with the power of utterance. And we can find many references speaking about the same fact, like the book of Nehemiah 9.3, Second Chron Chronicles 34.3, and First Timothy 4.13. We can read the, some of these references. Nehemiah 9.3 And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of a day. And for another quarter of it, they made confessions, worshipped the Lord, their God. Second Chronicles 34.30 30, 34.30, not 3. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, and, they, and he read in their hearing all the words of the Book of the Covenant, all the words of the Book of the Covenant. Usually it is the Book of Deuteronomy from chapter 1 to the end of the book, chapter 34. First Timothy 4.13, until I come, devote yourself, Paul is writing to Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scriptures to exhort and to, to, exhort, to exhort and to teach. Notice that all these references speak about public reading out loud. Now the ninth way is the breath of God and it's already uh, sp explained in during the talk. It is Second Timothy 3.16. All scriptures is given by the inspiration of God, and the word inspiration in the, in, the, in the Greek means breath. It releases divine life, and it imparts God's life into the reader. Now the last one, the word of God and the spirit of God. Sorry, this is number 10, still we have another two. The word of God and the spirit of God. Usually, they say, you cannot read the Word of God without being aware that the Spirit of God is nearby to help you. He's a helper. He's a comforter and helper. In what way does the Spirit of God help? He is the eyewitness. This is written in the book of John, chapter 15. The Holy Spirit is the eyewitness. He is the one who was there in all the events of the Bible, witnessing and leading and controlling everything. He is a writer of the Bible. He was there in all the events happening. He was an eyewitness. So as an eyewitness, he can take me in spirit to the place and time of the event or let me part of it even, I can see, I can hear, I can share as if I am there, not no more here, but in an event in Jerusalem, in, uh, in Rome with Paul and whatever. This seems very strange to us, being so linked, so imprisoned in the material world, in, in, in the earthly realm. But it is real for those who really want to go into the spirit realm and go deep in the Word of God. John 15, 26, according to the English Standard Version, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And the Greek word means he is eyewitness. Now, number 11th, the 11th way. Number 11, literal immersing in the Word of God. Literal immersing in the Word of God. Literal immersion in the Word of God. Reading the Bible, different books from both Testaments, 
reading the Bible from, for many hours can uh, sorry, it is what does it mean uh, literal immersion in the Word of God? It is reading the Bible for many hours. One known experience called visual night. Uh, visual night means to spend 12 hours reading the Bible from sunset to sunrise next day. Don't get a mist. This can be done. The Holy Spirit can enable anyone who is really uh, uh, hungry to, to, to be in the Word of God. It depends on, 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 on me and my heart uh, and how, how do I like to do that. They said, the early worshippers said, we are really immersed into the Word and a lot of defining effects sweeping in our lives. We spend all the hours among the people and here and there. All our lives are, are there. We are really immersed in the Word with all the dirt there. So we, we need to have the counteraction by immersing ourselves in the Word of God to get cleansed, enlightened, and revived. The Word defiles us, darkens our minds, and darkens our senses, and brings death to our inner man. So we need to counteract this. Again, being filled with the Word of God in such a way brings special measure of discerning and leads us to be filled with the will of God. Thus you can say truly that we have the mind of Christ as it, as it is written in 1 Corinthians 2.16. Now the last one, the twelfth way, number twelve. Two levels in reading the Bible. Two levels in reading the Bible. The direct level and the indirect level, or the deep one. The direct level means the direct understanding and applying the Word of God in our daily life. This is very important to show us the biblical standard of the proper Christian conduct. But the deep one, when the hidden secrets and mysteries of the Word of God can be disclosed, this is the mature, solid food that strengthens the inner man and leads to full maturity, and this brings glory to God. This point needs more elaboration. So we give examples from some biblical stories and how the worshippers of early centuries understood the, the, these stories. For example, if they are reading the story of Zacchaeus, Luke, Luke 19 from 1 to 10, Zacchaeus, when they read the story, they know that it is a real one. This is a direct reaction. Understanding and applying what they can receive from the story. To search their hearts for any wrongdoing or repent, but they also may notice the zeal of that man and the humility towards the event of the visit of Jesus. Deep down in the story, they could see other meanings. He was small in stature, short. So they react saying in their prayers, Yes, Lord, my spiritual stature is also so small, so short. Please come and pay a visit for me, for my inner life, so that it grows more. If they are reading a story of the blind people healed by Jesus, when he came and touched them, they will react saying, Lord, I need, to I need you to help me to restore my inner sight. Give me discerning. Touch my inner eyes so that I can behold your glory. If they are really reading in the Samaritan story, the story of the Samaritan woman, the direct meaning means it is clear. Jesus is led, Jesus is leading this woman to know him and to know the secret of praying in spirit. It is a real story. But still, deep within the story, they could find other mysteries. It is all, it is well known that the Samaritan people only knows and accepts the authority of the five books of Moses only. They do not agree about all the Bible, of the, all the scriptures of the Old Testament. They only accept the five books of Moses. 
This is, this is their, their Bible. So, the early worshippers reading this, this story and that I try to go deep in, in a deeper level of meaning, they could see different dimension in the story. Not denying the real direct meaning. But they can say, oh, the story helps me to understand that the level of a spiritual attitude of the soul, the five husbands refer to, the five husbands in the story refer to my soul who is still living at the level of Old Testament, not knowing the other one, the sixth one, Jesus. As if he's saying to her, as if Jesus was saying to the woman, you have five husbands, you have five books, but you need, and the sixth who is living with you is not your husband because you have not yet united with him. I am here. I am here to unite with me. And they go in that meaning uh, uh, to pray for their lives, to really get united with Jesus. Does not they do not deny the real facts in the story, but they try to turn it to be their own personal story and how they can uh, pray it out. It is not now the story of the Samaritan woman with Jesus, but if I stop here, it will be an external story, a story not related to me. It is a story in the Bible having its lessons. But what about me? I like to personalize the story, to be my own story. I am here in the, in, the, in, in the place of the woman, and Jesus is here, and I'm saying, Lord, I don't want to live with the five husbands only. I don't want to live, this is my soul as a woman. Don't live with the five husbands. I'd like to unite with you. You are coming here to, to give life, and I like, like to unite with you at the source of life. And finally, the book of John in particular is a book when one can put himself in the place of Jesus and then can pray the same prayers written in that book. These are the 12 ways they use to deal with the Bible. And this concludes the topic of reading Bible. Thank you.